but and corruption seems to be drying up. These are large steps forward and they were made against fearful odds. These people, let's dig them up and pee on their bones, shall we? Washington Post, April 1959. Remember I mentioned them a little earlier? It would be a great mistake even to intimate that Castro's Cuba has any real prospect of becoming a Soviet satellite. You can't be all this wrong by accident. Newsweek, April 1959. Still helping out, are you? Castro is honest, and an honest government is something unique in Cuba. Castro is not himself even remotely a communist. Former President Harry Truman, July 1959. Fidel Castro is a good young man, trying to do what's best for Cuba, and we ought to extend our sympathy and help him to do what is right for them? U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower, July 1959. Remember Dwight Eisenhower? He complained about the dangers of the military-industrial complex after he left office. Didn't really seem to do much about it while he was in office. But afterwards, he said, well, this thing I can't do anything about now, which I could do something about before, is really bad. So, Eisenhower said, Now these things, Castro communist accusations, are charged. But they are not easy to prove. The U.S. government has made no such charges. Fidel Castro, while visiting favorable reporter Herbert Matthews at the New York Times offices in 1959. Without your help, and without the help of the New York Times, the revolution in Cuba would never have been. We'll get to the death count. The New York Times is responsible for shortly. Author... Alberto Fantova said, 562 men have been riddled by firing squads without trial by this time. Habeas corpus have been abolished, and Cuban jails have held five times the number of political prisoners as they had under Fulgencio Batista. For the first time in Cuba's history, many of the prisoners were women. Their crime? Having been wives, daughters, and mothers of the executed men. Most of these were of humble background, many black. Castro's sister, Juana Castro, would later testify before the U.S. Congress about her concerns about the revolution starting in 1959. She said, I started to worry about the road the revolution was taking, a revolution that was supposedly democratic. They started censoring the press. They also started infiltrating the ranks of the revolutionary army with communist leaders. I knew of the plans for intervention in all schools in Cuba, both public and private, Protestant and Catholic. I also knew that they were planning to expel priests and nuns. In 1960, U.S. ambassadors to Cuba, Arthur Gardner and Earl Smith, warned about Castro's communist plans and testified under oath to Congress about the media-slash-government collusion, which brought Castro to power. Arthur Gardner said, In my everyday contact with the State Department, I always stressed this point, that I felt that Batista had proved a great friend to this country, and his administration had proved a great ability to develop the country itself and develop the friendship with us. Warnings, warnings, warnings! Don't you all think that when you ring the alarm, someone's going to show up? Sometimes they just show up to disconnect the alarm. Arthur Gardner said, And I feel it very strongly that the State Department was influenced first by those stories by New York Times and Herbert Matthews, and then it became kind of a fetish with them. No, it's not, not a fetish, Arthur, just, just pro -communist. Earl Smith said, The State Department played a large part in bringing Castro to power, the press and other government agencies, CIA, members of Congress, are also responsible. We refused to sell arms to a friendly government, and we persuaded other friendly governments not to sell arms to Cuba. Yet, on the other hand, revolutionary sympathizers were delivering arms, bodies, and ammunition daily from the United States. I wonder how many Soviet spies remained in the State Department even after this is post HUAC, post McCarthyism, and. Um, the State Department policies did not get hugely impacted by the anti-communist rooting out of the uh, HUAC and, and of Richard Nixon and of Joseph McCarthy. So, 
Earl Smith went on to say, Castro gave every indication of being a Marxist from the statements which had been made in Mexico, Costa Rica, at Bogota. Also, he had been active in the FEU. I did not have the proof at that time that he was. However, there was no question that there was communist infiltration and communist control of this movement. Senator James Eastland said, your advice was that it was not in the best interest of the United States for Castro to come to power. And yet in spite of that, of your advices to our government, you say that our government was primarily responsible in bringing Castro to power? Earl Smith, that is absolutely correct. Batista had been in control off and on for 25 years. His government was disintegrating at the end due to corruption, due to the fact that he had been in power too long. Police brutality was getting worse. On the other hand, there were three forces that kept Batista in power. He had the support of the armed forces. He had the support of the labor leaders. 